Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Masters. I'm the managing editor of SC Magazine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webcast, The New Security Stack for a Cloud Mobile World. This session is sponsored by OpenDNS. With increasing numbers of workers now operating from beyond the traditional office environment, the appliances and controls that network managers have used for the past 25 years to defend their enterprises from malware and other cyber attacks have become antiquated and inefficient. Applications are now stored on cloud servers, offering convenience to mobile workers, but presenting challenges to IT security personnel responsible for ensuring networks are not compromised by misuse and cyber intruders. The good news is that a new security stack is emerging that enables freedom for users and control for IT. Our speakers today, David Yulevich, CEO of OpenDNS, and Todd McKinnon, CEO of Okta, will be discussing how to design the new network for direct-to-internet, how to think about users first, and how to extend your existing security investments with APIs. After working for more than a decade in the security and Internet infrastructure fields, David Yulevich founded OpenDNS and took on the CEO role to solve growing security challenges. As the co-founder and CEO of Okta, Todd McKinnon is responsible for the company's overall strategy. Prior, he was head of engineering at Salesforce.com and held various engineering and leadership roles at PeopleSoft. There will be a Q&A following the presentations, so we encourage you to type in any questions for David and Todd via the interface. Actually, the presenters have given me permission to ask a few audience questions during their presentation, so we might get a few of those. David is going to speak first. Welcome, David. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, it's wonderful uh, to be here, and thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, also happy to have uh, my friend Todd McKinnon here with me. So we're excited to talk to you about the new security stack, and you know, to make good use of everyone's time, we're just going to dive right in. So I think that you know one of the things that's worth pointing out before we talk about individual sort of solutions and what people are are doing to tackle security today. You know, I think it's important to understand what's changing in the IT landscape and in the, the sort of attacker landscape that's causing security to be in the news every single day. And one of the things that we're, ha we're seeing happening is a couple things. One is the attackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated and more financially motivated than ever. They're not just looking to compromise machines in order to send out spam or to do DDoS. They're actually looking to compromise machines to either exfiltrate information, harvest credentials, exfiltrate intellectual property, or whatever the case is. And because they have this ability now to sort of try every lock on every door and get increasingly sophisticated in the way that they do that and to automate their ways of doing that, we see that as the IT landscape changes, they're trying locks and doors that have never been tried before. As networks become more and more porous, and we'll, we'll talk about this more in a moment, the attackers are often targeting these weakest links. So if you look at attacks that you know we've read about recently, whether it's Target or, or Home Depot or others, there, these attacks are often coming in not through the front door and at the headquarters and in that corporate castle, but instead they're coming in through other means, through third-party applications, through vendors that have you know credentialed access. Uh, and so I think it's important as we talk today with, with Todd from Okta, and we talk about our solutions to understand how identity, how network visibility, and how these, these important fundamentals of a strong security posture map to the way that we work today. And so when we talk about the, the changes and why these, why these, you know, it's not just that attackers are getting more sophisticated. When we talk about what's happening, I think it's important to understand the shifts that are happening in the IT landscape that are giving rise to companies like, like Okta and OpenS and why people are looking for new ways to deliver security and why there needs to be a new security stack. And if you think about the way people have used computers over the last 25 years in the enterprise, 30 years in the enterprise, traditionally the people thought of their, their enterprise as a corporate castle. The people came into the office, their files and their desktop computers were in the office, and you had all the important things, all the enterprise applications, all the people, all the data inside this corporate castle. If you wanted to protect it, it was pretty easy. You would set up your identity management solution inside the office. You'd sometimes hand out hardware tokens. You'd launch your enterprise apps inside your data center that was inside your office, and everything was protected by you know these castle walls where you'd set up your firewalls and rack and stack all these appliances. And, you know, you'd establish these best practices for security, 
just by putting all this stuff at that, at that one entrance and exit of your network on the perimeter and by doing centralized on-premise identity management. And that doesn't work so well today because if you think about the way people are working, they're increasingly moving their applications to the cloud because it's more efficient and economical. They're moving their infrastructure to the cloud because the ability for developers to move quickly, the ability to scale up quickly, and the, uh, the, certainly the, the economics of it are just sort of too overwhelming to stop. And a lot of these on-premise solutions that were originally deployed that helped you establish your security posture just don't work anymore. And more than that, it's not just that applications are moving to the cloud or that data is moving to the cloud, but the people have also left the office as well. So you now have a world where people are sitting at Starbucks using their own laptop and then logging into Salesforce or into Box or Dropbox or into Google Apps and all these cloud services, and that really is a wildly different IT landscape than the one we've had for the last 25 years. And it requires thinking and asking yourself, how do we reestablish all these fundamental security best practices that we've had for the last 25 years in enterprise computing, but how do we reestablish them in a world where the people are outside the castle, the devices are outside the castle, and the data is outside the castle? And, you know, so we have our approach on the network side, uh, and I'm excited to have Todd here to talk about the identity and access management side. Uh, and we think that it's really a, a great opportunity to learn about how people are looking at reestablishing their best security practices in the world that, you know, how to be a CISO in 2015 is really the, the, the idea here, to how, how to understand why there are lots of new tools out there, what the incumbents are doing, and uh, I think it'll be exciting to, uh, to go through that with you all today. And uh, Todd, I don't know if you have anything to add on the, the identity management side, but I know that we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. No, I, I, thanks for having me, David. It's great to be here. I, I mean, I think this is a huge, I mean, everyone on this webinar knows that this is a huge trend in the industry, and I think people are struggling with, you know, how, people are struggling with how do they incorporate this new reality and, and keep it secure at the same time. And the one thing I talk to people when I talk to customers and prospects and people in the industry is that, you know, a lot of times our first reaction, especially those of us that have an engineering background or a security background like myself, a lot of times our first reaction is, you know, we need to lock this down, we need to stop this, and we need to prevent all risks. And what I caution people and make sure everyone understands is that, hey, in a lot of cases, the biggest risk may be not taking advantage of all the new opportunities that this new world affords us. So being left behind and locking everything down and not taking advantage of the new innovation, not taking advantage of the, the new opportunities to move our businesses forward, to make our products better, make our company stronger, um, and take advantage of it. Of course, we have to do both, right? We can't have undue risk, but, you know, making the same mistake to stay with the old stack and lock it all down and secure it and audit every last detail does set us at risk to um, not, not advance like we could. So you get, we got to keep both in mind. Absolutely. And in some cases, people will just go out and sign up for services on their own, yeah. right? And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we find uh, sort of always interesting is when people talk about even things like BYOD in the context of this landscape, it's not even just about bringing your own device, it's just about using your own device wherever you are. And, uh, you know, as Todd just said, you know, people are taking advantage, individuals are taking advantage of these new opportunities. And so it's certainly uh, in the best interest of the enterprise to take advantage of them to accelerate their business and to help capture all the opportunities out there for their, for their teams to, uh, to advance. Okay. One more thing, you guys could let me interrupt. Uh, uh, questions come in that I think uh, is relevant at this point. Um, if you allow me to present this question, given that everything is moving outside of the perimeter, do you think that attacks are actually going to grow before they go down? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things are happening. I'll, I'll do my best to answer it, and uh, Todd, you know, can can uh, can take a shot at it as well. You know, I think that, first of all, a couple of things are happening. One is that attacks are being discussed more openly than they have been in the past, so we're having more visibility into attacks. We also know that, you know, the, the, the attacker infrastructure is increasingly being realized to be much more advanced than people thought. The attackers are much more organized. They're setting up attacks in advance. And so, you know, I think that we, we see that there were attacks that were happening previously that maybe we didn't have as great a visibility into. So there will be more attacks, and I think it's probably going to get a little bit worse before it gets better mostly because a lot of enterprises have not yet made the shift. You know, a lot of our customers, we're now sort of evolving, like Okta is, it's sort of away from the early adopters now into more of a mainstream market, but there's still a long way to go. I mean, we, you know, we don't have 80% market share. We have a much smaller, you know, we have a tiny percent of market share. And I think that when customers look for how do they adapt to this new IT landscape, there's still a big, a big gap from where some of the more uh, sort of, you know, the emerging vanguard of customers are from where the rest of the market is. 
Yeah, I, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that you know, there's there's a you know there's a an old saying where they ask. I think it was Jesse James. You know, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's because where the money is, right? <laughs> I think that if you look at what's happening in the world, every business is becoming more of a digital business. Every business is taking more advantage of technology. More and more things are moving online. So I think there's more attack surface, you know, just because of that inevitable progression and growth of technology. So I think commensurate with that, you're going to have more attacks. Attacks are going to go up as there's more to attack, as there's more information, as there's more business done on, on the Internet and online. But what I think will go down are successful attacks. I think that that's the key thing we have to watch, like the successful attacks and particularly the headline attacks. I mean, as an industry, we have to do both. We have to take advantage of all this innovation, but we also have to make it more secure. And I think we'll get better at that. I think we'll get better at locking down the basic things, and you're not going to have these headline – you will have these headline attacks, but they will be less and less frequent because they'll be less successful attacks. That's right. Terrific. I think we're going to move, uh, move forward, and then uh, happy to take on more questions as we go through this. So I think one of the things when we think about a new security stack – what we've realized in uh, spending a lot of time with customers and going out in the road and seeing how enterprises are working today is that they have a strong security posture when it comes to protecting their corporate, their corporate network and their corporate perimeter, but they really are starting to look at new solutions when they start to think about how do they then adapt and take advantage of the new services that are out there, how do they reestablish these fundamental best practices of security. So if you think, around, if you think about a solution like you know, a, a source fire uh, IDS or a checkpoint firewall, or you know, a WebSense gateway, things that give you incredible visibility at the edge of your network by looking at traffic as it passes through on, your, on its way to the Internet. People are looking for new ways to establish that same kind of visibility, but in a way that applies to all your branch offices or to your 100,000 employees that are out in the field and you know, your multiple devices and millions of devices that are out and deployed on the Internet that may not be behind a corporate network. And so people are using solutions like ours to get that kind of network visibility in a way that they would traditionally get it from a network perimeter-based appliance. We see people, you know, turning in their RSA tokens and their hardware tokens that are deployed with on-premise management solutions and instead using solutions like Okta that both help manage the authentication and login and identity for solutions that are on-premise as well as enabling better access control and identity management for solutions in the cloud so that when you hire a new employee, you can quickly provision them across all the different cloud services that you're using, and even incorporating multiple, more advanced password uh, solutions like Duo, which we happen to use both Okta and Duo here at OpenDNS. And you know, with Duo, you can do things like multi-factor authentication. You can look at where's the user's phone relative to where their IP address is coming from, and do all kinds of really advanced security that you could never do before in this old stack. And we also see people looking for increasing ways to both secure the data, whether it's at rest or at, whether it's on the fly, moving to the you know across the internet being stored in the cloud or being shared and worked with you know, across different collaboration solutions. So people that may have used things like Vontu in the past to do DLP on-premise are now looking at solutions like CypherCloud and SkyHigh and actually trying to get a bunch of these different solutions to integrate with each other so that people can get a much more holistic picture of where their data is, what their users are doing, what their devices are phoning home to, who the people are connecting to so they can have a much stronger security posture. And we think that's really, a, you know, the, the, the dramatic shift in the, in the IT landscape requires a shift in thinking about how you reachieve and reestablish those, you know, those IT security best practices. And traditionally, the perimeter-based and on-premise-based solutions only, you know, give you a, a, an increasingly limited view of your network posture and of your security posture, and you need to start covering these blind spots that are growing in your company. And, you know, as Todd mentioned, take advantage of the opportunities that you actually get by adopting these solutions, right? You know, people are deploying Salesforce and not deploying on-premise CRM for a reason, because it's easier, it's faster, and it's more accessible. So I want to talk for a minute about the OpenDNS solution, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Todd to talk about Okta. So OpenDNS has built a global network. We have 25 points of presence around the world, and our goal is to have a global infrastructure that is able to deliver security to you wherever your employees are, wherever your branch offices are, whatever devices they're using, simply and easily and doing it without, you know, in a way that doesn't impact performance. And what you get from that is you get immediate visibility to network traffic. So if you have infected machines that are beaconing out to command and controls, we want to help log that, analyze that. Obviously, we want to block it, but we also want to surface that and raise it up to you so that you have global visibility into your organizational network traffic and not just at your main offices, not just at your HQ, but when you have, you know, reps that are out in the field or you have engineers that are out on the oil rigs, 
or you have executives that are you know, at the airport or at Starbucks or wherever they are, you want to have a global 24-7 vantage point into your security posture and not the traditional 9 to 5 you know, visibility you have with on-premise network security appliances. And so we make it very easy to deploy our solution. People point their traffic to our DNS servers, and then it goes from there. And one of the things that happens by leveraging a global security network in this infrastructure we've developed, and this is a network where we run all the routers and switches and servers. We, you know, we own and operate our own network. Is today we have more than 65 million people every day that run across our network, and we log, store, and analyze the traffic patterns and the data that we're able to aggregate from all those users, along with a bunch of data from other sources, whether it's WHOIS data, domain registration information, uh, whether it's HTTP payload information, information coming from sources like VirusTotal and others. And we aggregate all this data into something that we call a security graph, and we run that data through a set of classification systems that allows us to extract insights and actionable intelligence about emergent security threats. And one of the things that's very cool when we analyze this amount of data is that you know, attackers are unable to hide on the Internet. They have to set up their command and control infrastructure. They have to set up their payload sites. They have to set up their drop sites. And we've built the models and classification systems to analyze this data and figure out where are parts of the Internet that you don't want to beacon out to, that you don't want to reach out to, that you don't want to talk to. And when new sites are registered on the Internet or when new IP addresses come online, we can very easily put them into this security graph database and use that to figure out where we should allow our customers to go to make sure that they don't get infected or that they don't exfiltrate intellectual property or, or you know, proprietary or sensitive company information. And we've been doing this now, and again, we now have 65 million people every day that run across this infrastructure and use it to have a much stronger security posture and to get visibility into their employees' network traffic and to provide enforcement for it. The last thing I want to say before I hand it off to Todd is that one of the things we realized over the last uh, couple of years is that having this global infrastructure for delivering security as a service wasn't just great to deliver our own security, but increasingly we realized it could be used to actually deliver the security of our partners. And so we launched a partnership with uh, FireEye at the beginning of 2014, uh, and now we've done that with Checkpoint, where we're able to extend the intelligence from on-premise appliances so people that have bought FireEye but only have, the, only have it protecting their corporate office can now extend that intelligence globally and use our technology and our infrastructure much like they would use Akamai as a CDN to distribute content quickly, they use our service to distribute security quickly. Uh, and one of the cool things is that lately we've now created APIs and platforms so that even the threat intelligence providers out there that have proprietary feeds of data can leverage our infrastructure to deliver enforcement against threats that aren't the threats that maybe we've found or that we've come up with, but are threats that may be based on your own corporation, your own industry, maybe you're part of the financial services sector, uh, and it's really created this powerful platform for enforcement and for visibility. Uh, and so that has worked out very well, and it's helped our customers get broader visibility in a way that they never have had before. And I think that's a good segue to talk about, you know, the other parts of the security stack, including the identity management piece. Thanks, David. Again, this is Todd McKinnon, and I'm talking a little bit about Okta. And I think that to understand Okta, you have to go back to something I said earlier, which is, Okta, our customers and people that use Okta and think about using Okta, they've, they've bought into this idea that cloud and mobile can really move their companies forward and, and make a better environment for their companies. Of course, they have to manage risk and keep things secure, but they're really trying to uh, improve their businesses, grow their companies, make their end users more productive. And the problem is that in a lot of these, when you take a lot of these new cloud services, applications, infrastructure, or a lot of these mobile scenarios, and as David mentioned in his uh, comments, put them into the old stack, there's a lot of friction. And it impedes the progress and impedes the, pro the innovation you can get and, and the progress you can make here. And it's, it's largely because in the old stack, the, the stack of on-premise software and lockdown networks and firewall perimeters and thinking about the Internet as something that your folks might once in a while go to to, to learn about some products online versus a, a um, implicit part of their business and their day-to-day -day activities, you really could pick. You could pick either I want to make things accessible and make the end user experience very seamless and easy, or I could make it secure. Lock it all down, put it behind a firewall, make it uh, heavily constrained behind a VPN, not make it accessible anywhere out, and it was really a choice of two worlds. And what we found in our success with our product is that by providing this identity management as a service product, by providing an easy solution for single sign-on, an easy solution for access control, compatible with on-premise networks and cloud services, 
you, what that gives you is that gives you fine grain control over two very important elements. One is identity, so you can control who the users are, what services they have access to, what groups they're in, which entitles them to what kind of access, and you can control at a fine level the endpoint and what kind of devices they're accessing from, what's permitted, what's not permitted. And by having a system that lets you manage and model those two elements, it really can let you do both. You can provide a great user experience, a user experience that users are, find very easy to use, very productive. They know exactly where their services are. They can access them from anywhere. They don't have to worry about which networks they're on or uh, detailed policies that in the past they would have had to worry about. And you get the security you need. You can trust that only the right people are accessing the right services, that the right accounts are turned on and turned off at the right time, that you have the right authentication policy based on which device, which service. So it really is the best of both worlds, and it's required if you want to move your organization, your users, your customer base forward in this new world. And Okta, we think about us as really kind of enabling this by providing this identity management and this mobility management service. So the core of Okta really is, I talked about, um, think of Okta as, um, it's really a, it's a, it's a highly scalable uh, directory service in the cloud. But it's not only a directory service in the traditional sense of an LDAP directory or something like Microsoft Active Directory, but it comes pre-integrated to thousands and thousands of cloud services. And also it's customizable so you can integrate it with services you may build yourself or services, uh, new services that may come up in the world. So instead of being a toolkit that requires the person implementing it to wire it up and know the detailed protocols, it com comes pre-integrated to everything. And this catalog is continuously maintained and growing and growing uh, rapidly every day and further removes that friction of adoption of these services and security once you do adopt these services. Okta also uh, manages the mobile device, so it puts the right native applications on the device, automatically provisions those applications. It, uh, it, it separates business data from personal data, so you can model and secure, bring your own device scenarios for your employees. And, um, you know, and it really, it really makes this whole, the end-to-end -end scenarios from what you want to do on the mobile device all the way to what you want to do on these cloud services completely integrated. One of the very simple examples that is, is really frustrating for a lot of customers before they use Okta, it's a very simple example, is, hey, when I, whenever my, I have to, my password expires in my exchange account, I, don't want, I want that automatically, when I update that password, I want it to be automatically updated on the server and on, on the client so that my mail client doesn't retry that password and then lock me out of the server. And that seems like a simple use case, but it's actually hard to solve until you have this completely integrated service that knows about the server, or the back end, the application, and knows about the client, and can, knows about the authentication and the user. It has all these elements so that it can seamlessly automate that password reset end to end. That's just one example of how, by having this system of record of identity and mobility and, and users, you can remove the friction by automating an end to end scenario. So there's a bunch of more, uh, more use cases our, our, our platform supports in terms of um, automating HR system-driven provisioning inside the enterprise to uh, being a set of APIs that customers can embed in their own products and their own platforms that they're building uh, to take advantage of the business opportunities that are out there. Uh, one example of this is Adobe has embedded Okta inside of their Creative Cloud products to be the identity layer that connects the Creative Cloud to all of their global enterprise customers. So this is an example of Adobe removing the friction using the cloud by connecting their security of their network to the networks of their thousands of enterprise customers around the world using Okta. So it's a powerful use case of, of um, you know, a company moving forward, moving their business, increasing their top line by removing the friction. So yeah, that's what we're all about, you know, taking this world and removing the friction for end users, giving them one user ID, one password across mobile, across the web, uh, get one centralized IT management console so your IT folks are more productive, get visibility to everything in terms of who's using what, who's authorized for which devices, and then finally for developers so they can embed strong identity inside of their products, make them more, more productive and, and move their companies forward. So um, as you can tell, both David and I are super fired up about everything going on in the industry and um, the opportunities for not only for us to build great companies but for everyone in this webinar to play a key role in the evolution and, and drive their businesses forward. You know, one thing as we were um, 
earlier talking about the trends going on, one of the most exciting things we didn't mention, and that is like, think about what's happening. Security and technology is boardroom level conversation. Boardroom level conversation, the board of the biggest companies in the world are thinking about this, thinking about the opportunities and the risks. And what that does for all of us is it raises our prominence in the whole ecosystem as IT folks, as security folks. I mean, you're seeing IT leaders being promoted to um, CEOs and people that have been able to move their businesses forward and be great security leaders and great industry technology leaders rising in prominence in all these organizations because this stuff matters. And I can't imagine a more exciting time to be working in our industry and be uh, taking advantage and helping this transition going forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, I'm pretty pumped up about all this stuff. That was uh, that was awesome. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with, with Todd. This is an exciting time to be working in security, both creating products, but also to be a security practitioner responsible for your enterprise's security posture. And, and it's true. Security touches everything. And so as people figure out how to deploy security appropriately, how to raise their posture for security and raise the bar, uh, it certainly bodes well on making us all look good as security uh, experts and security people that love the idea of helping enable our businesses to be more successful, to be able to conduct their business more successfully and more securely. Uh, and that does mean that the sky is the limit for all of us. I think we're going to move into uh, some Q&A. And uh, so, Greg, I will... Uh, I will pass the, the, the mic to you a little bit and see, uh, I think we've had some questions uh, from the audience. Okay, David, yes, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, we can move on to the Q&A. Um, first one I got for you guys, it's always been hard to get security systems to talk to each other. Do you think it will be harder or easier if things are in the cloud? So I think that actually one of the things that, that's an important that, that question brings up is actually this important idea of like you know why why can't the incumbents just do this stuff why 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 do we need to think about security in a new way how will the cloud help enable that and so the, the shift to the cloud provides a bunch of changes one is that, that there are a bunch of reasons why the incumbents and, and I know Todd has a bunch of thoughts on this because he and I talk about this all the time but there's a bunch of reasons why the incumbents won't make the shift to the cloud and one of them is that, that they just have never had that mentality so it's not just that their businesses aren't oriented that way, but they've never had the mentality of, you know, continuously having release cycles and release schedules. They've never had the mentality of creating APIs to promote interoperability, right? I mean, Okta exists based on the idea of interoperability and APIs. That's not something that ever, ever was designed when, you know, RSA was creating their proprietary identity management solutions. There are things that we've done at OpenS to enable the threat intelligence industry to leverage our infrastructure so that when they go to a customer and say, hey, we have a feed to block, you know, we have a feed of bad stuff, and the customer says, great, what do I do with this feed? Now they can go and say, hey, we have a feed of bad stuff, but you can use someone like OpenDNS to actually do the enforcement to block those bad things, and not just on premise, but to do it on or off premise, on any device, to do it in a 24-7 way. And it's because we sort of, these companies have grown up in a cloud era where we have both the APIs, we have both the infrastructure, the cloud is certainly an enabler of a stronger uh, security posture. And I think that the cloud, is, without the cloud, it would be difficult to have all these new startups and all these new tools interoperate. We know that the customers sometimes complain a little bit about having to deal with lots of different vendors, but it's because of these APIs and platforms and solutions like Okta that it's actually making the integration and the adoption of those different services much, much easier. Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting question. You know, like um, what is, what is the cloud? What is what is really different about the cloud? Especially when you think about the specific questions about is it easier to get things to talk to each other? And one of the simple things that is true about modern cloud technology that wasn't true in previous generations is, you know, since you don't since as a user as a consumer of these products, you don't own the database, you don't own the network, you don't own the log file, right? You, that's just the architecture, right? You don't own it. It's in someone else's data center. And because of that, the vendors have had to build better APIs. I mean, I saw this. I used to run engineering at Salesforce.com, and we built the best API in the industry, way better than all the legacy software products, simply because the customers didn't have our database. They couldn't do a SQL query and get the information any other way. So we had to. It was, it was actually, if we were going to survive, we had to build an amazing API. And you look at all these cloud companies, all these cloud products, you see that reflected over and over. They have the best APIs. They have the best um, way to introspect them and see what's going on. So it's led to a much more open and, I think, uh, a possible to integrate environment, which is powerful for customers. That, that's, uh, that's certainly true. One of the other things that, that, started, that you know, I, I remembered while we were talking was that 
The other thing that happens is that by doing security in the cloud and by leveraging cloud security uh, providers, the providers that offer their security solutions as cloud services, is that we as cloud providers of security can, can, can extend our infrastructure very, very quickly and dynamically, meaning that if we're looking at a whole way of looking at logs or analyzing data and we need to go spin up a thousand servers to do more advanced analysis or to do better, you know, checking of authentication records and to do better access control and to leverage computation and, and technology in a way that it would be very difficult to, to recreate and, and replicate on, like, you know, a one new appliance, we can go out and just do that and provide that benefit to our customers overnight. That's something that can't be done with, without the cloud. And so uh, I think that our ability to leverage the cloud, even as a cloud provider, um, it, you know, advances our ability to help our customers. What, uh, what else uh, do you have, Greg? Okay, David. Um, yeah, I just want to encourage everybody out there to key in any questions you might have for our presenters. Here's one for you. Uh, during the presentation, you made a great point. There is more attack surface. There are some new services coming up which reduce attack surface using reverse proxy. What do you think of those? Sure. So I think that by talking about reverse proxy, they're talking about things like you know using SkyHigh as a as a you know uh, an intermediary before somebody you know uses Okta to log in to, to Salesforce. It goes through a proxy that that helps manage the access into that cloud service. I think those things are really important. But so those things give you really granular visibility, but only into one particular cloud application. They're not proxying all your traffic. And so we think that OpenNS is a very nice complement to those things, where we offer a port and protocol agnostic view of your network traffic that's sort of in a lightweight and highly performant way. And then, in fact, it's a, it's a very nice handoff to someone like SkyHigh that can give you much more, more granular, sort of almost down to the data level, access control of, you know, who has access to what particular report in Salesforce and, you know, leverage their identity management solution actually help enable those things to happen. So, I, you know, I think that, you know, just like you have a, a racked and stacked uh, set of security appliances at the edge of your corporate network to provide different layers of the security stack, you want to help recreate those similar benefits in a similar way in a cloud in a cloud delivered motion. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's an interesting question. So I, 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 I think that the right solutions here are anything you're doing that's trying to centralize it all is going to be challenging. Because anytime, anytime you're trying to build a, like a central, you're getting back to the castle David t talked about, right? You're building the castle walls and you're kind of like saying everything inside the castle is secure and I'm going to guard it, I'm going to protect it. But, you know, and then like, Everything outside of that is bad and malicious. And I think that the, the way to do it is more of a distributed model, like David talks about, with open ENS, 24 data centers, really weaved into the fabric of the distributed Internet, or like what, what we're trying to do with, we know about every user no matter where they are, about every mobile device no matter where it is. We, we don't think about how to make this castle in the middle. Because like to, to stretch the analogy maybe a little bit, if you build this castle, then the unfortunate part, you might be secure in the castle until someone breaks the wall down and then you're not. And you also have to live in the castle. You can't go out in the world and, like, get all the benefits of it. So I think that these reverse proxy solutions and the network monitoring solutions aren't the right approach at a very high level. Of course, in specifics, they could be very valuable. But just philosophically, I believe in more of a distributed model, more weaving yourself into the fabric of where people are, where devices are, and where the whole Internet is. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Um, can you comment on the use of mobile analytics integration? How do you manage security there? I think we're going to have to try to guess as to how to interpret the yeah. question. But you know, I think one of the things that's happening is that when you when you leverage you know both solutions like Duo uh, for for actual sort of password management and things like Okta for identity management and OpenDNS for network you know uh, visibility and enforcement. You actually, those solutions can all leverage each other. And so, you know, the example I gave earlier was that, you know, if, if Okta sees that I'm logging in from, you know, Kyrgyzstan, but, but, you know, my IP, or, or from, you know, here in San Francisco, but the IP address I'm coming from, you know, my phone says I'm in San Francisco, but my IP address says I'm in Kyrgyzstan, those are, there are ways that Duo and Okta and OpenS can work together to help share that information and actually establish a stronger security posture, right? You know, when people talk about two-factor authentication, as one particular technique that people often deploy when they use things like Okta and Duo, what they really can be taking advantage of is multi-factor authentication, right? So sometimes factors are, are explicit, like you put in a, a passcode or you put in a PIN, 
but but sometimes they're they're implicit, meaning they look at the location of your device, they look at the IP address you're logging in from, and there's a whole bunch of other factors that can be used to help you know raise the bar for authentication and and allowing access and doing access control and you know OpenAS is creating the APIs to also help enable that on on our end so that folks like Okta and Duo can take advantage of the data that we see on the network. Yeah, we think about uh, we think about mobility as uh, in a couple ways. One is that you have to make sure that you secure the content on the device, right? And you do that by making sure the OS isn't jailbroken, making sure the device has a passcode on it and things like that. Then you have to make sure that the device can be used as a vector of attack. So that you have to make sure, again, the OS is good, that the, it doesn't have malware on it, and so forth, and it's secure. Um, and then the third thing is you have to make sure, as David mentioned, that you use that mobile device as an asset in your security posture. So you use data about where it is and where the user is. So it's not, you know, you're letting someone log in with, with an identity that's not where their phone is. Or you make sure that you use the capabilities of the phone to capture a touch ID from the fingerprint or uh, a strong token, a, a second factor with a token generated on the, on the phone. So those, those are the three ways we think about mobility. And it's, uh, you know, just doing the basics, like some analytics on logins and some strong authentication can make you a lot less susceptible to a lot of uh, types of attacks. That's true. I think we have time for, for maybe a couple more questions, uh, if they're out there, Greg. Yep. Uh, okay, here's one. Threat intelligence is the new buzzword these days. Is that part of the new security stack? Yeah. One, I mean, one of the things that's been really interesting over the last, I would say, 24 months or so is the emergence uh, of companies that have you know, what I would describe as sort of proprietary analysis or proprietary feeds of threat intelligence about adversaries on the Internet or attacker infrastructure. And, you know, it's, you know if, those are, if that's too many buzzwords in that sense, the way to explain it is there are sometimes like industry-specific groups. So in the financial services group, there, there are security groups within those industries that share and collaborate on attack information. Facebook runs a, a threat intelligence group that shares information about attacks that might be happening against, you know, brute force attacks or other kinds of attacks against, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and other social networks. And so they have these, you know, pseudo-proprietary or proprietary feeds of intelligence, and some of them are now selling those feeds as a service. And one of the things that customers have, have talked about is that it's great to sometimes have a feed of those, of those intelligence uh, and threat indicators, because you can then cross-correlate them in your log systems, but it's even better if you know that there's active attacks going on or active adversaries that are out there and you're able to identify them ahead of time, that if you can turn that into enforcement, then it's very powerful. And so, you know, if you're, uh, if you're managing uh, an authentication system or if you're opening an S and we want to make sure that our, you know, 65 million users don't beacon out to a known bad IP address or an IP address that we know is a drop site for, for, for people that are stealing information from a corporation, we just want to block those connections. And so on our platform, we can integrate those feeds and actually turn them into enforcement for our customers. And that, so those, 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 that industry is, is fairly new, and I think it's still relatively small, but it's the commercialization of sort of what used to be happening on an ad hoc basis between security professionals that now has been both standardized through a bunch of different APIs and also commercialized with, you know, SLAs and, and different sort of niche, niche aspects of the, the threat landscape that they're trying to cover and, and uh, give visibility into. Todd, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, mean, I I didn't. I felt like I was talking too much, so I didn't want to crowd in too much. But I, I think it's. I mean, when I talked earlier about yeah, the, the surface area is increasing as more things are digitized, so the threats, or the attacks are going to increase commensurately with that. But the reason why one of the reasons why I'm most optimistic about our ability to have fewer successful attacks is because of innovation that takes advantage of big data and all the threats going on, and and is smart about thwarting those threats based on how they're emerging, how we're communicating. I mean. That's kind of stuff, that's kind of innovation that's exciting. It's the reason why we will win. I mean, the reason why successful attacks will decrease. That's right. It's hard for okay, attackers follow, to hide the Internet. Go ahead, Greg. Exactly. Yeah, no, just following up on that, another question about logging and analytics. How do you see that in the new stack? Where do you get the logs from if everything is in the cloud? Yeah, Todd, Todd might be better to answer this question. I know from our standpoint, you know, Todd made a point about how Salesforce had to build the APIs because customers didn't have access to the, the database to run queries. We figured out that our customers need the same thing. So while we provide reporting and analytics in our dashboard and our interface, we've actually created a way to stream our logs directly into an, an Amazon S3 bucket that the customer controls 
and gives us write access into, and then they can take those logs themselves and put it into their SEM system. They can download them for analysis. They can they can essentially do what they want because we've we've discovered customers want access to those logs and they belong to them. Yeah, I think that's that's a great object lesson. What I was saying earlier is these cloud companies need to expose it. And we have the same kind of thing in our product. We have analytics tools and we have reports about what we see, and then we also can export everything in Okta that we see into another SIM or another tool as well. Um, I mean, you have to, like I said, it's a distributed model. You have to be able to get to the edges and control and, and see what's going on to some degree. I mean, the details matter, but to some degree you have to be able to get to the edge. You can't, you can't just rely on the walled castle that you control and that everything has to live inside of. It's just not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna let you fulfill what you could do as a company. Actually, it's sort of a funny, a funny story. Before this, uh, webinar started, we're, I was talking with somebody here on the team about how we do this log streaming, and when we when we announced it, we talked about it as being cloud to cloud, as sort of a, a way of integrating two cloud services, where somebody could take our logs and stream them to Amazon S3, and then they brought up that it actually can be cloud to cloud to cloud. So we have customers where we stream our logs directly into Amazon, and then that customer uses something like Sumo Logic, which is a logging platform in the cloud, to pull those logs out of S3 and do their analytics against them. And so I thought that was very cool, and it's a good example of exactly what we're talking about, which is enabling people to share information and to, to, to use the APIs and platforms and power of the cloud to really gain better visibility and increase that security posture. Okay, thanks, David. Here's one more question. What about security on the endpoint? Is that not important in the cloud mobile era? I think it's, 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 not, it's not critical, and that's why, we, that's why we have our mobility management product. I mean, you have to, you have to get to the edge. To have it successful, you can't, it can't be a castle. You've got to get to the edge and secure the edge. And, um, it's a, I mean, it's a, like, there's a lot of detail there about what that means and the kind of risk. There's a lot of great companies trying to, trying to help secure that and taking different attacks or different, um, that was a bad choice of word, taking different attacks at, <laughs> at, at securing that. And, you know, we have ours that's an awesome product called Octa Mobility Management, and there's lots of other good ones. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to get to the edge, and it has to be flexible. It has to let end users do what they want to do, but still keep them secure. Um, and by the way, on the screen now, there's a, you can go try any of this for free. Um, at, at Okta.com, get Okta free as, as it shows. You can also do the same for OpenDNS. That's an awesome product that um, is, you know, we use at Okta. We love OpenDNS. We use it. It's an awesome product. You should go try that as well at signup.opendns.com. That's right. The, uh, you know, the fundamentals of enterprise security has been predicated on controlling, you know, getting visibility and enforcement on the network and trying to do everything you can to control the endpoint. And the question is, how do you do that in today's landscape, and today's computing landscape? And often open the answer to the strongest ways you can do it today, which is probably a good way to wrap up. Okay. Uh, yes, and, and with that, that will have to be it for this session. Um, our thanks to Open DNS's David Yulovich and Octo's Todd McKinnon for sharing their insight and expertise today. And, of course, thanks to all of you for tuning in. This webcast will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SC Magazine website under the Events tab. For SC Magazine, this is Greg Masters. Thank you for joining us.